Good afternoon to you all and a very warm welcome here today. Uh, my name is Fintan Quill. I'm the Global Head of Sales Engineering with KX Systems. Today I'm going to be talking to you today about a simple, fast approach to analytics for big data and the Internet of Things using KDB+. I'm joined here today by my colleague Doug Talbot of Bidara Research Labs, a partner company of KX. A little later, Doug will be talking about bringing big data and IoT to life with an interactive analytics environment built on top of our database, KDB+. Making a correct choice for the appropriate tool to tackle big data problems is becoming an increasingly difficult task. As a displayed infographic from 451 Research shows, the big data landscape is saturated with many different solutions, solving something similar but slightly different. It has generally been agreed upon that there is no one-size-fits-all approach. However, what if somebody proposed a solution to you that could solve many of these problems? Sounds interesting, right? What if the same solution gave you high performance while reducing the total cost of ownership and system complexity? You'd probably think I'm lying. Our aim today here is to prove that this is indeed possible. At KX Systems, we have been dealing with these big data problems for over 20 years, long before the phrase big data even began, gained prominence. Financial services companies have been taking advantage of our database, KDB Plus, and programming language Q, to gain an edge in one of the most competitive industries in the world. For those of you familiar with London and the London Underground map, you'll notice that we're in Canary Wharf, which is quite ironic given our financial services heritage. At more and more conferences I have attended recently, there appears to be an increasing need for real-time or near-real-time analytics. Gone are the days when overnight batch processing times are deemed acceptable. However, in-memory only solutions only go so far and sometimes fail when they run out of system RAM. With KDB Plus, we have the ability to manage both streaming, real-time and historical data in the one platform using the one programming language. This is extremely important for systems that require low latency performance while also, also use it using historical data to bring context to the real-time data. The historical data is essential for backtesting, forecasting and predictive modeling, etc. Many of these database systems built on KX technology handle billions of real-time rows and also trillions of real-time rows. The high-level architecture diagram you see here is a typical KDB Plus setup. On the left-hand side here, you see an arrow which shows the data coming in. So this could be data from a smart meter device, from a market data feed handler, or from an oil well. And as the data comes in, this is done via a feed handler which is typically built in a compiled language such as C, C++, or Java. And the data first comes in to our KDB Plus events engine. So all of these items here in orange are all KDB Plus files and or processes. So when the data comes into the events engine, the first thing that happens is, is it logs the data down to a transaction log file on disk. And this log file typically resides on a very fast hard drive or solid state disk. So the reason for this is that if any of your downstream in-memory processes go down for whatever reason, you have the ability to replay this data from the log file so you maintain transactional integrity. And the simplest example of a subscriber to the events engine is the real-time database. So the real-time database subscribes for everything from the events engine, and it copies it into its own in-memory tables. So thus, when you query this real-time database, you get really, really fast in-memory performance. A slightly more complicated example of a subscriber could be the streaming query engine. And the streaming query engine will subscribe for a subset of the data, such as a specific um, number of stock tickers or a specific set of smart meter data on your grid. And as this data is coming in, calculations are being made on the fly. So this is extremely computation intensive by comparison to the real-time database, which simply just does simple insert after insert. So then when you query for the specific calculation, you will get instantaneous access because these are much, much smaller tables in your streaming query engine. And then, at a predefined interval, the events engine will, subs uh, will show down to its subs uh, subscribers that you need the end of day or the end of time period has been reached. So in the case of the real-time database, the data is purged from memory down to disk to our historical database process. So the historical database now gets a new shard or a new partition. 
And the historical database has the nice advantage of being able to take advantage of the operating system file cache. So the data is page faulted into memory. So any subsequent queries on that data get in-memory performance. And down at the bottom here, you can see that you can have applications and APIs which can connect to all of these KDB Plus processes. So they can connect via pub sub or via traditional query and result. And we have many different APIs available for C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Python, and then we also have ODBC and JDBC connectivity and connectivity to R and Python. <coughs> so, as mentioned earlier, on top of our, um, our database, KDB+, we have our programming language, Q, which is a language which is really built for big data analytics. But what are some of the advantages of this programming language, you may ask? Firstly, Q runs in an interpreter environment, meaning you can type queries directly at the command line and get results instantaneously. Q is also an array programming language that supports vector operations. Loops effectively disappear when programming in Q. Our roots are in the array-based programming language, APL, which has been around for 50 plus years. The native support for vectors becomes even more of an advantage running on the latest processors, which support vector instruction sets. Q also supports user-defined functions, which allow for complex analytics to be run directly on the database. Alongside functional programming, Q can also run SQL-like queries, which we will see shortly. The merging of the functional and query paradigm in the one language allows functions to contain queries and queries to contain user-defined functions and native functions built into the Q language itself. Also, tables and dictionaries are first-class data types built into KDB+. They're not an afterthought bolted on after the fact. Q has built-in parallelism, which can take advantage of a multi-core or multi-server architecture. Parallelism is set up very easily via command line flags and keywords within the Q language, unlike very heavy, clunky, multi-threading interfaces you see in a lot of other languages out there. Q also has support for native time series, which I will discuss a little later. <clears throat> As you can see on this slide here, you can see some sample queries. So the first query we have here, for those of you familiar with SQL, is pretty simple looking. What we're doing here is we're do selecting a column called open, which we're defining on the fly, to be equal to first price. So the assignment operator in the Q language is colon. So the SQL equivalent here would be select first price as open. So not a huge jump here. And then we're also doing the high as maximum price, the low as the minimum price, and the close as the last price. So for those of you with SQL experience, this isn't a huge jump. Now the following two queries, this query here is performing an aggregation and a foreign key join using the Q language. And then the query below it is actually the exact same query written in standard SQL. So as you can see, SQL doesn't preserve order, whereas KDB Plus does. So when we do aggregations, we do group by and order by, and we actually just move that inside of the select statement. So as you can see, you cut your code down in half and you reduce your system complexity hugely, and you get much, much faster performance. <coughs> Now this line here is showing the functional side of the Q programming language, where the function is contained within these curly parentheses. So this is a complex function doing a sum of a reverse of a square root of a log till of x, where till creates a sequence from zero through n minus one. So x is our input parameter, so what are we passing into this? We're running this function over each of these values here. So here what we're doing is we're creating an eight item vector. So then we run this and it runs very, very fast. But in the second example here, what we're doing is we're actually parallelizing this. So we simply parallelize, by instead of uh, calling each, we replace that with peach, which stands for parallel each. So for example then, if you were running this on an eight core machine, if you ran this query and say it took eight seconds to run, and then you ran it on this query, it would take just one second to run. So you get parallelism virtually for free, and it's all done under the hood and abstracted away from the end user. Many of you may have heard of the flash crash on May 6th of 2010, which caused the Dow Jones to fall over 9% in just a matter of seconds. You can see the sharp price drop here on the diagram. However, the most important part of this diagram from our perspective is actually the message rates that you see at the bottom from all of these various trading firms and brokerage firms. The message volumes being consumed on the data reach historic levels on this particular day in the region of tens of millions of messages per second. 
Our customers reported to us that KDB Plus was comfortably able to handle these volumes. These volumes would typically see the CPU usage of our events engine between 1 and 5%. However, on this particular day, it went up to 15%. So as you can see, one single CPU, we had plenty of room to spare. Early last year, electronic trading systems hit the front page news with Michael Lewis's Flash Boys book. The IEX trading team, who are the focal point of this book, recently chose KDB Plus to be the big data backbone for their entire technology stack as they seek to become recognized by the SEC as a stock exchange. All of their trading data and reports are captured and run off KX technology. IEX are one of the many financial services firms using KX technology as their big data solution, and we're proud to have them as our customers. <clears throat> one of the key components of being able to support Internet of Things is the ability to capture and store time series data. Time series data is at the core of what KX technology has been doing. However, what are the key characteristics of time series data that IoT needs, which KDB Plus can deliver? Firstly, KDB Plus has several primitive temporal data types built into the database. This allows for extremely fast and efficient aggregation and bucketing of temporal data to enable drilling down at extremely high speed, something which Doug will be able to display elegantly on his next few slides. KDB Plus also supports date, time, hour, month, second, millisecond, and even nanosecond timestamps. The high level of granularity allows for high precision calculations to be made at very high speed, something essential for many IoT applications. Temporal arithmetic is also built directly into KDB+. This is something which many databases have forgotten or simply don't have the capability of doing, typically storing timestamps as character strings instead of actual numbers. Bi-temporal joins are critical for applications such as matching quote and trade on a stock data or measuring high-frequency harmonics on electronic transmission grids for more efficient power usage. KDB Plus is one of the very few databases to support bitemporal and window joins. These joins can also be applied to the data as it streams into a system, even before they're tabulated. About two, year, two years ago, we were chosen to take part in a proof of concept on a large smart meter implementation. The use case involved mimicking several years of smart meter data, which came to approximately 25 terabytes in total. During the proof of concept, over nine different database technologies were evaluated from SQL, NoSQL, NewSQL, Hadoop, and appliance database technologies. During this proof of concept, KDB Plus achieved the highest performance on every single query. And when I talk about highest performance, I mean from two perspectives, both speed and memory footprint. KDB Plus was also um, found to have great native support for the smart meter data model owe to all of the time series facets which we discussed on a previous slide. KDB Plus was also found to have the lowest TCO, and that's from two different perspectives. From a hardware perspective, there was 10 to 50 times less computing infrastructure needed than the other competitors. The KDB Plus implementation was run on a single 4U commodity server. Developers using KDB Plus were found to be five times more productive than other database developers. This is due to the combination of the notational efficiency of the Q language and the simplified architecture design of the KDB Plus implementation. Overall, we like to think that this proved that KDB Plus helps simplify big data from both the hardware and software perspective by reducing the number of machines to increasing developer productivity and responsiveness without sacrificing on high performance. I now thank you very much for your time, and I will hand you over to my colleague and friend, Doug, who will discuss the analytics tool they have built on top of KDB+. Thanks very much, Vinton. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a, a product we call Ivy, and it's an interactive analytics environment. Um, it's for big data. It was designed specifically for big data. It combines our expertise in doing IDEs, or interactive development envi environments, with uh, KDB Plus's uh, great technology under the hood. And by combining these two things, we think we can get to a really, really rich interactive experience where you can work with data in real time, and I'm going to show you a bunch of demos on that. 
Um, it's a rich suite of web-based tools. The thing's totally web-based with obviously a server in the back end. Um, it's got a REPL-like editor, an Excel-like spreadsheet, and I'll show you those things so I'm not going to belabor the point too much right at this moment. Um, and the other thing is that I, uh, what we've done, we were so impressed with the KDB Plus technology uh, that we actually imp implemented our server in it. So we're effectively uh, eating our own dog food, so to speak. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, KDB Plus and Ivy in the context of three demonstrations. So the first demonstration is going to show you fast loading, fast querying, and fast rendering of about a billion records. Okay, you're going to see us bring a billion records down to size. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the importance of being able to tumble your data interactively and in real time. And then the third thing I'm going to talk about is how we uh, do installs using KDB Plus and Ivy. And uh, the fact is we can do an install from a, uh, you know, a, a nothing server to a full analysis in uh, less than 60 seconds. Okay, so let's get started with the first demonstration. What we're going to do is we're going to take a billion records down to 60 million records in one query. It takes 70 milliseconds. And then we're going to produce a binned heat map in six seconds from that. Um, a few little notes here. We're using our log files off of our system, so we have about a billion log files there. It's a, we put it up on an Amazon cloud, so there's nothing special here. And we've done absolutely no tweaking and no optimizations, and there's no query optimizations of any kind. We're just using the raw stuff right out of the box. Um, the data, so you know, is date partitioned, and it's both on disk and in memory. So we can pull it off disk and put it in memory whenever we want. Uh, and it's all done by KDB Plus under the hood for us for free. Uh, so there's the query, right? It's uh, select from T, where T is a table of a billion records, where month is January, effectively. So we're going to take, a, we've got a billion records for a year. We're going to pull one month's of data, and that'll get us down to 60 million. And then you'll see us do a bit of rendering on that. So let's get started. A thing to note uh, is that we do our rendering on the server. We gave up on that client-side uh, rendering stuff, D3 and all the JavaScript, because we were just getting, we were just getting killed. Uh, we killed browser, browsers on a regular basis. So this is your first glimpse of Ivy. Uh, down the left-hand side there is a local and a shared repository. You can switch back and forth. And what that means is that your analysts can now collaborate and share and push and pull data. It's very Git-like. So you can just push things into the repository and pull things out of the repository. On the right-hand side at the top is a little script. And I'm going to run that script. Uh, so let's get started. It kind of goes fast, so I'll narrate quickly. OK. So what we're doing here is uh, we're, we've loaded the data. Uh, and now we're going to display it. Uh, I'm just showing you the count there. It's a billion records. I'm going to inspect this. So now I'm opening it up in our inspector. And you can see that this is fairly fast performance. Um, and then I'm going to zero this query down to uh, one month of data. So there's the 70 milliseconds that it took. I put a timer on it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to open that up, and we're going to inspect that. And uh, what you're going to see here is that, first of all, it's quite responsive. Uh, we're looking through 60 million records here. And uh, now we're going to get to that heat map. And so I'm going to switch over to uh, show timestamp and uh, destination port. And I saw 31 bins across the x-axis and 50 bins in the y-axis. And uh, so what this will do is now produce a heat map in uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about five or six seconds. And so what you see here in this heat map is uh, a bunch of uh, port information across the bottom. Uh, but more interestingly, you can see this little blip here. And what that is is really a packet attack on our system. And so I'm going to zoom in on that. And then I'm going to actually brush that data so that you can uh, actually interrogate it a little further. So what you can see here is we've gone from a billion records down to about 70 million records, and then obviously been able to uh, go in and drill down fairly quickly in a four or five second span. 
Okay, so the next demonstration that I want to show you is how you can actually interactively tumble this data to find some meaning in it. And what you're seeing here is a, a model called Latch across the top. It's an organizational model based on location, alphanumeric, time, category, and hierarchy. It's by a person named Richard Saul Werman. And then down the side is a bunch of analysis techniques that uh, you can use. And what we believe is that you want to be able to tumble and turn between these two different things and tumble and turn between those different analysis, uh, those different visualization techniques to find meaning in your data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run this next demonstration. And what it is is uh, it's a, a demonstration. Uh, maybe I'll make this a little bigger if I can. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to load up some synthetic data. It's a bunch of cell phone records. Uh, it's a very small file of about 9,000 records. And then what we do is we poof it up to 35 million records using uh, KDB+. Uh, the records themselves are from the VAST, uh, VAST challenge, so the Visual Analytics Challenge. And what they contain is uh, source uh, and destination uh, cell phones that have been obfuscated, obviously, and they are numbered 1 through 400 for destination and 1 through 400 for source. There's a date stamp for every single phone call. Uh, there's a duration for every single phone call. And then there's a cell tower associated with every phone call. So then what we're going to do is we're going to load up some cell towers. And uh, what's, it, what's in that? And so here the towers are loaded almost instantaneously. And there's uh, an association of longitude and latitude for every single tower. And what we're going to do here is join that. So this is really how you do joins in uh, uh, KDB+. And so we're going to see long and lat now associated uh, immediately with those 35 million records. So each one of those records is now associated with uh, a cell phone longitude and latitude. So then what we're going to do now is we're going to go into that inspector again. And uh, as you can see here, you can um, sort of move fairly quickly through this information. Uh, we're only looking at about 35 million records in this particular case. Uh, but really, it's not so interesting to just look at this as a table, even though we always allow you to do it. What's more interesting is we're going to look at it a few different ways visually. So we're going to look at it in terms of a histogram. and so. Here we are rendering 35 million records in a set of bins, and so they come back almost instantaneously. Uh, those are 20 bins, uh, and so what we're seeing is the counts in each one of those bins. But really, we want to see more granularity than that, so I'm going to increase it to 200. Uh, I'm going to increase it to 200 bins, or, and so what I'm going to see here is two phone two cell phones per bin. And really, that's not very interesting either. So what I'm going to do is start looking at it and tumbling it. And here what we see is the destinations, so the people receiving calls. And we see that around 300, there's a peak in uh, call uh, number of uh, destinations receiving it. And also down here at the 0 to 5 range, there's a bunch of uh, obviously very high volumes of people seeing uh, receiving calls. So. Uh, what we'll do now is I'd, I'd make a note of that, and uh, now we're going to take a look at it by date. So this is what an analyst would be doing, tumbling this data and getting value out of the data. Here we see uh, night, uh, sorry, night, day, night, day, uh, but we have this really interesting pattern down here where all of a sudden there's sort of a lot of calls in the middle of the night, which again would be kind of very strange behavior there. So what I'm going to do here is plot duration. This is something I would typically do if I was looking at the data, and I see it's very standard distribution, so there's nothing really interesting about this. Uh, so what I'll do here is I'll get to the point, and I'll go over to a scatter graph. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this data uh, from a date across the x-axis, and I'm destinations across the, uh, the y-axis. And what you're going to see here is something pretty interesting. What we can see is that across the top here, uh, around 300, uh, some individuals at 300 started receiving uh, lots of phone calls. And what you're seeing down here at the bottom is there was a lot of calls being made to in around zero and something, and suddenly they drop off. 
So that's interesting enough that I would then want to increase the granularity and look at this and take a closer look in detail. And sure enough, the pattern pops right out of the data. So what we've done here is we're looking at 35 million records and we're able to pull a pattern out of that in about three or four seconds and probably in the space of about five or, you know, over five or six minutes, you'll see some patterns emerge. So here I've drilled down and I've actually now can see 306 and 309 are pretty interesting. Those are the people who increased, started receiving more calls. And now I'm gonna look down here at the uh, lower level and I'm gonna see uh, that it's, uh, I think, one in five or zero in five that have stopped receiving calls. So what we can do with Ivy is we can use KDB Plus and make queries on the fly. And so here I am, I'm gonna make a query and uh, I get back the, uh, a much smaller set, it's somewhere around three million records. And uh, so that's really interesting to me because it's starting to confirm a suspicion of, suspicion of mine, which is uh, one and, uh, five and 306 and 309 might be the same people. So now I'm gonna exercise uh, the, the uh, date feature where we can look at longs and lats. And again, we're looking at about three million records or so, and now they're plotted. So I'm gonna zoom in here and I'm gonna take a closer look and I can see where they are on the map. So this means that we can now look at like millions and millions of records and uh, longs and lats very, very quickly. Uh, I'm gonna flip over now to more of a social graph view. And so what I'm gonna look at here is distinct sources by destination. And what that'll give me is a graph where we have just the unique edges. And so what that means is it'll plot very quickly. And I noticed something really fascinating. All the purple balls are the callers and they're calling into the yellow balls. And you'll notice that they're calling the same people. So in other words, all those people who are calling are the same people and they're calling uh, a couple of individuals. So we can almost conclude from this that five and 306 and one and 309 are probably the same people. So that gives you an idea, uh, really, it sort of tells you how you can, um, using Ivy and using KDB Plus, you can uh, very quickly tumble your data to get meaning out of the data by identifying patterns that you might not necessarily see. So it's a really nice way of doing really fast exploratory. And these are sort of, I just threw these numbers up for you, where we can see a million records is five seconds and a hundred million records, you can get these kind of responses in nine seconds. Okay, so the next demonstration that I'm gonna show you is how quickly you can install the, the, uh, the two uh, items, IV and KDB Plus. And what I'm gonna do here is do an unzip and put it into a directory. I'm gonna assign a port using a script. Then we're gonna open a web browser and log in. We're gonna create a workspace and then we're gonna poof up a record set of 100 million records in very, very short order. You'll actually see it in uh, real time. Oh, I can't show you that one, unfortunately. I don't have a movie of it. So you're just gonna have to believe me on that one, that uh, what happens is we are able to uh, uh, load that information uh, in uh, about 35 seconds. So what we can do is we can uh, unzip it. Here, sorry, I just wanna. So in addition to that, uh, what we also have are some additional tools that will make your life, uh, analyst life easier. Uh, we have an importer and a transformer that allows you to basically import and transform data uh, without having to program. We have a visual query builder that allows you to do visual queries very much like MS uh, SQL. So if you're familiar with MS Query uh, and their query builder, it works very similarly, except for it works on billions of records. And then finally, we have a big data spreadsheet uh, for nonlinear analysis. And so I'll just show you that one last demonstration. So here is our, uh, what you're gonna see here is a, uh, the environment and I'm gonna open up a spreadsheet here and you have to remember that every time you load these spreadsheets, um, what happens is it has to actually do the query and then uh, load the information and load all the other queries. So if you have 25 queries in the spreadsheet, it's doing 25 queries, for example. So here, 
what we're going to do is we're going to load up this, uh, this uh, spreadsheet, and now it's loaded. So basically what that's done is loaded about 15 or 16 million records in that space of time. Um, and it's really just using all of the standard KDB Plus and Q queries. Uh, so then we can, each one of these cells can hold as many records as uh, you want. So you can have full tables in there, billions of records in any one of these cells. And um, the thing that I want to show you here is that in behind the cells, we have just a bunch of select statements there. So basically, if you have analysts that are comfortable with using uh, uh, SQL, they'll be very comfortable working with this uh, spreadsheet. Uh, the last little piece that I want to show you is that uh, if you want to, you can actually, and you know a little bit of JavaScript programming, you can actually make your spreadsheets even more interactive and easier to use. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create a combo box that's going to have a bunch of values in it. And then what we're going to do is as soon as we save that off, uh, we can now use that combo box interactively, and you'll see the numbers updating in the cell beside it. So what that means is that we're uh, able to wire up our interfaces, and you can create uh, what I call higher order interfaces for uh, less sophisticated analysts. And you can do this all in a spreadsheet environment. So effectively, you can have a broad range of individuals that can use the, uh, the product, uh, people who are uh, what I'll call really tech savvy, all the way down to people who really don't know how to program, and they can just simply do point and click. And so with that, I will turn this back over to uh, Vinton. To wrap it up. So, thanks very much for the presentation, Doug. Apologies for the interruptions. Um, so, we're located at booth number 621. And for those of you that are interested, we do have a free version of our technology available if you go to kx.com. And we'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. And any, any questions or if you want to see further partner demonstrations, we have partners speaking at our booth number 621. Okay? Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, so we, we've dropped that now. Since April of last year, the 32-bit version is available for free, so there's no restrictions, no timeout. The only restriction is the fact that it's limited to the 32-bit address space. So you've got all the full features of the Q programming language, and there's no timeout or anything like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly people have, have run KDB Plus in different VM environments, Linux containers, etc. I mean, obviously, it's one of these things that, you know, if you can run on bare metal, it's obviously better to run on bare metal, but certainly people have used particularly Linux containers and Docker in the last few years. So, yeah, there's no major problems. Obviously, there's things like bus contention, so you don't want to be running it on the same machine, and you have to be NUMA aware as well, making sure you're running it on the same, and uh, not running it on the same socket so you don't have memory contention. Um, I don't think I have any figures off the top of my head. I guess try it and see, but you know, no specific figures that I can think of now. Yep. Uh, it can run on a single node, or it can run on a distributed cluster. So you can do either or. Gen, go ahead. Sorry. Um, we have, um, at several of our large investment banking firms, there are multi-petabyte installations. So these could be running on one server that's attached to a, like a SAN or a NAS as well, or it could be run in a multi-server setting. Generally speaking, most people have run on one reasonable size server rather than running on a cluster because it's real high performance stuff they're doing, so they don't want to be shifting huge volumes of data over the network. Yep. Yes, Doug, you can handle that, yeah. It's, it's uh, 15 gigabytes of, uh, of RAM. <coughs> so 
was the straight uh, C3 2X large box with nothing done to it. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.